So, Tammy Potter Horn, which way do we? Do? Tammy Horn Potter is the, I mixed up there, is the Kentucky apiculturist, uh, but also an author of several interesting books. And I think she's got some interesting things to tell us. So, your second speaker for today, you got a hard act to follow there with Ellie, but go ahead. I know you're up to it. So, go ahead, Tammy. Yes, I, I knew that. Um, well, I am not sure how many of your attendees know about my work, but I, I like to kid people and tell people that I wrote the past, present, and future of beekeeping with my three books, uh, Bees in America being the past. I wrote that in 2005 when I was a horrible beekeeper. I mean, I was one of those people that, that Ellie is talking about that the commercial beekeepers just made fun of, and um, I, I have no shame in admitting that. I just, um, it, there was a long learning curve. Um, the second book is all about women and beekeeping, and I traveled around the world to write that book, but I also uh, had the good fortune and, uh, you know, uh, able to, to work out an arrangement to work with um, the Big Island Queens in Hawaii, and uh, back when it was owned by Pam and Randall Bashir, and then as it transitioned to the Oliveris uh, Bee Company, um, and it was incredibly invaluable in shaping that second book and also the women that I met in that whole process of writing that book. Um, and so uh, then I ended up finally and kind of haphazardly um, wrote Flower Power, which is about my I work on, and that particular book was actually uh, prompted by Larry Connor, who wanted a primer in how does one start working with corporations to get more pollinator habitat on the ground. So, you know, when Jerry asked me if I would talk to you tonight about these about these works and my dog-legged career, if you will, uh, that's the modus operandi behind um, this presentation, if you feel like I'm, I'm losing touch. Um, much, throughout much of early history, our ideas about bees were, um, you know, analogies. Uh, our political leaders and our religious leaders would use a honey beehive as a way of crafting and defining order. And um, especially in the 1600s, uh, this is a time when people were just beginning to learn that, uh, that the hive is in fact was governed by a queen and not a king. Previous centuries, it was just assumed that a king would uh, be in charge of a hive. Uh, but by the 1600s, that had begun to change. But there were still other ideas that people held on to tightly. And, and not just people, but people of importance, like I said, political leaders, religious leaders, um, Napoleon, uh, you know, they, uh, they embraced the ideas of bees and used bees to kind of foist upon people their ideas about what hives should be. And so analogies then became social policy uh, for, for much of much of our history. And it's only been in the past 400 years that we have begun to separate ourselves from these analogies. Um, the most dominant one, of course, is that our society is like a hive of bees. And if you want to explore uh, the thinking of the 1600s and how embedded beehives were into early consciousness, I have the source here, Karen Ordahl Cooperman's uh, work is in America and European consciousness is, is the go-to text for this. It is a fascinating article. Um, and, and if it's been a while since you've taken uh, a logic class, I wanted to uh, just remind you of what an analogy is. Uh, just a very basic definition is a comparison between two unlike things. You, typically we use like or as. Um, and a famous one is uh, Forrest Gump, and I may be dating myself now, uh, but of course, forever and a day, people in my generation would say, well, life is like a box of chocolates. 
And you have to think about, well, why is life like a box of chocolates? And you have to think, okay, well, you know, some experiences are really great. You know, some experiences are like that, you know, that block of chocolate that has caramel in it. And then some are the butterscotch ones or the, the strawberry cream ones that you could really live the rest of your life without ever trying again. But taken together, the whole consortium of those chocolates is a gift, right? I mean, life is a gift and it's about trying new things and to keep trying, you know, to, 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 to appreciate that you have an opportunity to try new things. Um, another analogy that is in the news of right now um, that may hit a little closer to home is this idea that we are living post-pandemic through a K-shaped recovery, using that letter K to describe how with some people who had, you know, wealth and resources prior to the pandemic, you know, they just keep increasing. Um, you know, I have one friend who was doing well before the pandemic and, you know, through the pandemic, I mean, she's decided to invest in a boat so that she can go out on the lake and not be around people who are partying in the city. Um, and she's, she's done very well. Her investments have done, have done very well. I have another friend who's had a medical emergency. Um, you know, in fact, this month, it will be the first month in her working career. She's not received a paycheck. Um, you know, we've set up a GoFundMe for her. You know, it's, you know, she has cards in her pocket. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it's, you know, she's the other side of that case. She's the part of the, the leg that's going down. And um, the, the, the real issue, I think, right now for, you know, many of us is how do we balance this out? Uh, we've always prided ourselves as a nation on being a land of equal opportunity. And we see right now that we've got two very divergent paths. Um, and so uh, I'm quoting Janet Yellen here, um, but that's basically just to give you a definition. If you haven't heard this analogy being tossed around that we're in a K-shaped recovery, that's, that's what it refers to. And to bring this back to honeybees, um, I mean, I think most of us hear analogies every day when I tell people that I'm the state apiarist, especially in May, I get the I get the phrase, "Oh, you have to be busy as a bee," and of course it's true, um, or that I'm a worker bee for the the agriculture commissioner, and that's true too. Um, so this is one that we still trot out a, a lot. Um, another one that uh, you know is. I think we're finally beginning to maybe move away from um, because the, the flip side of analogies is not only do they simplify complicated phenomena, they also oversimplify things to a point where they can be what we call a false analogy. And that has certainly happened with drones and it certainly happened in the 1600s. Um, remember in the 1600s, England is a country that is struggling with overpopulation. Um, at this point in time, there's a major transitions in climate, such as what we're experiencing right now. The Little Ice Age um, was very much in its element at this point in time. So because of poor transportation between cities in England, you would have one village starving and another village doing rather well, and there would be no way to help the village that was starving. And so the upshot of a lot of this uh, uh, bad weather, uh, changing land policies, um, is that you had people flooding the, the cities and religious leaders and political leaders were at a loss of what to do. How do we deal with this? If we have so many people coming into the city and we can't feed them, then one quick response tends to be is to blame the victims, right? And the beehive provided a great example in calling these people drones. And a quick response and solution 
was to send these drones to the English colonies, you know, because there was a lot of land, England wanted to expand its empire. And so this concept here of borrowing from a beehive, especially this, this, this idea here that drones didn't really do anything, you know, they just took up space, they just consumed resources. By applying that to poor people in the 1600s, English authorities oversimplify very co complex um, ideas regarding poverty that I think, and this is just my opinion, but in, in the United States, those ideas still permeate our political policies. It goes that far back. In other words, I don't see this as a democratic problem or a Republican problem. It goes back to the 1600s. And so, you know, when we're talking about poverty, then, you know, one of the things I think we have to do is to think about where I, our ideas of poverty originated. And many of those originated in the 1600s in England. Um, and we're still unpacking that. You know, we are still, to this day, we're still unpacking that. Another popular uh, analogy that was used in the 1600s and 1700s, 1800s, right up into the 19th century, when, when you know, people are immigrating to the United States in different ways, is the fact that healthy colonies swarm. I know firsthand, I've been doing nothing but catching swarms since April the 9th here in Kentucky. Um, that's a good thing. Our, our hives have, have come through the winter very well, um, but, but you know they have swarmed. And English authorities, once again, 1600s, looking at all of these women who may be having to turn to prostitution to pay for themselves, uh, for their food and their meals in the 1600s. You have men who can't find jobs in 1600 England. Um, so the, the answer is simply convince them to be part of this swarm that is going to the English colonies and helping set up uh, an extension of England. And that this is healthy. You know, that's a, that's a key component in the marketing of the pamphlets that are coming from the crown and the church at this time. And like I said, it's the kind of thing, it's the kind of concept that plays out again in the 17th century, 18th century, um, 19th century, and certainly in the 20th century, uh, as our country absorbed so many people coming in from World War II, for instance, from Europe. And um, so, uh, this is simply just a, 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 a summation of everything that I've said before. Uh, but and this particular graph I've taken from uh, Dr. Seeley's book, The Lives of Bees. And this is sort of the first migration uh, of the 1640s, 1622 in, in Virginia, um, 1640 in Boston. And, and, you know, I think what's unique at this point in time is that the colonists are migrating as the bees are migrating. And they're, you know, so like, not only do you have this group of people coming over this diaspora, we would say in academe, but you also have a biological diaspora, you know, bring the bringing of apple trees, for instance, and the bringing of hives. Um, and then you also have the ideas on top of those uh, hives that are being brought over and being disseminated among people. Uh, so all of that's going on there. Like I said, this is the first wave. Um, and then we get a second wave uh, in the 1700s and in the, in, you know, the 1900s. It's, it just, it keeps happening with these waves. But the thing, the, the analogies stay constant. Those don't tend to change. In other words, even by the time that the colonists have grouped together and have formed themselves into a country, this idea that people are like a hive, that stays constant. And that tends to transcend all of the languages that are, that are 
you know, being spoken in this particular um, area of land. I mean, not only do you have the Native American languages, you have Spanish, you have French, uh, you have German, you have Finnish. I mean, you've, it's the Slavic languages, um, you know, it's just an amazing melting point of languages. And so this, this symbol of a hive and the thoughts that we attach to it are the things that stay constant. Um, and so, and, and in part, that was because many of our beekeeping and honey hunting traditions were brought over from Europe. Um, the bees initially in the 1600s did better than the settlers, uh, than the colonists did. Um, there were 50% mortality rates in um, Jamestown. Um, the, the, the Puritans fared only slightly better, uh, but that was, as Karen Cooperman uh, attributes, they were allowed to bring their families, whereas the Jamestown uh, colonists were not. And the, you know, it's her thesis that it's the families that make that, those hardships of, of being on the frontier worth it. You know, in other words, a parent, if he thinks or she thinks that he can leave land to the child, they will endure those hardships and that that's what made the biggest difference between the Northern colonies and the Southern colonies, which tended to be more company colonies, more uh, military oriented colonies. Uh, it's night and day for her. Um, but we look at these, and, you know, this is from, uh, this is a postage stamp um, celebrating Ukrainian beekeeping, but this could look, and very easily, I, I've kidded before, this looks like Eastern Kentucky. This man here, this looks like my dad, who's from Harlan, Kentucky. He's got this little, you know, this little, um, this pipe that he's using as a smoker. That could have been my grandfather. Um, now, I've never advocated that we would use a lever system, you know, to haul ourselves up into a tree, but, but brown, brown bears in the Appalachian region have just, you know, it was thought that we were going to reintroduce these brown bears and get back in touch with our heritage, and now everybody's angry because all of these bears are destroying gardens and they're in people's trash cans. And you cannot walk outside in some of these haulers in my area without seeing bears and their cubs. You know, they have done very well here. Um, so this, like I said, this looks like contemporary um, Eastern Kentucky today. And um, I've pulled these photos from Dorothy Galton's uh, book, 1971. Um, it, as much to also just kind of give a brief plug to Apollonia, which will be held in this region. It's the Bashi, it's Ufa, U-F-A is the, is the easy uh, town. Um, the, the region I think is Bashir Khan, but I'm not Russian. And so I, I beg of you, don't hold that against me. Um, but Apomundia will be meeting here. It was supposed to meet here in 2021. They have deferred their meeting date until 2022. And if forest-based beekeeping interests you as much as it does me, you may want to, to, to consider getting on their Facebook page. Um, they will be demonstrating some of these early methods of honey hunting that are still being used today. Um, and not only are they being used there in Ufa, Russia, you can come to Harlan County, Kentucky, and I can take you to a beekeeper who still has hives in um, what we call bee gums, which is a short for black gum tree, uh, where a lot of the, the gums were made from because they decay from the inside out very quickly. Um, in, the United, in Kentucky, we were talking about uh, how every state has different laws. Kentucky does not have a law prohibiting the keeping of bees and bee gums. So I thus and therefore can't put on my little, you know, Barney Fife badge and go into the haulers and say, oh, Mr. Beekeeper, you can't have these. Um, it's not against the law in our state. Um, however, he and I are on, on uh, friendly enough terms that if he suspects he has a problem, I will go and I will take um, a, 
kind of a, a dental cleaning tool and or like a, a, a mirror on a stick and uh, you know just basically hold I'll have him hold the bee gum up and then I will take a flashlight and we'll look at those parabolas of beeswax that are hanging down. I will say this, um, you know, since the American chestnut uh, tree tends to get hit with a blight at the, about the three to four year mark, we don't have those huge bee gums that were as big as, you know, five people standing together. Um, you know, the trees are much smaller, so it's easier to do an inspection. Um, and I just threw that in there because I thought you may be interested in it. And this is a scap that I have in my office. I like to take it and show, um, well, all kinds of people. Uh, kids love it, especially when I tell them that um, the, uh, the exterior is coated with cow dung. That really, that really gets them fired up. Uh, but it also illustrates how transportable skeps used to be. And of course, skeps were a Germanic type of, um, of hive oh, and or, you know, Ireland had a lot of skeps. Uh, these could be easily transportable and used, you know, year after year if you needed to or, and or destroyed if they didn't do well. Um, and by and large, you know, I think that people tend to still, even today, have a lot of romantic ideas about skeps. Um, you know, we are very much an industry that's dominated by the movable frame hive for, for good reasons. Um, but, uh, but the scap holds on to our heart. And this is what people would use over and over again, especially churches who would try to help people, you know, who didn't speak the English language, uh, uh, you know, assimilate and feel comfortable. This is an image of comfort. And like I said, we still, we still hold on to this. I mentioned all of the different languages, and this isn't even close to including, including all of the different languages of the indigenous people in this country. Uh, I mean, you know, throw in another 30 to 40 uh, of the basics. We're not talking, you know, the, the, the smaller languages of, of Native American people, um, but we're talking like Cherokee you know, Shawnee, Choctaw, um, you know, Lakota, um, you know, there's a lot of variances of these going on. And so that, that, that use of the beehive pulls us together when there's everything else would suggest we would be pulled apart. And, um, and one of the contributions that Ben Franklin made in the middle of the Continental Congress, when you had the representatives at each other's throats over the issue of slavery, right? You know, he is recognizing that we need a common currency. You know, when everything else is pulling us apart in these colonies, as Britain is sending over its troops, it's Benjamin Franklin who, who pulls together a currency using the skep. And I think, you know, I mean, Franklin was brilliant in many ways, but one of the things that I really like about what he does here is that each one of the rings here, there are 13 rings, and each one of those rings stands for a, a colony. So he pulls them together in this one image. Even though the economics of that particular note were, I mean, you know, inflation was through the roof at this point in time. I mean, there was even a phrase that said, that's not worth a continental because it was just going sky high. And, and if you were a betting person, you would not have bet that these colonists would have been able to defeat these British military in the 1770s or 80s. I mean, like that's just, you know, you, you know, if you consider the training, you consider the money, you consider all of, you know, the ships, nothing, nothing would have said, hey, 
you know, these 13 colonies and pull together and, and overthrow the British government. But this idea can, and it does, and it still succeeds. Um, so um, 18th century, same thing. Um, the, the, the image of a sewing bee or a quilting bee, our, our most enduring one of these um, social efforts is, is the spelling bee, which is still going on. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we still have, a you know, much of our social, even though we have moved away from agricultural social gatherings, we still hold on to this term of being bees. Um, even as, you know, by 1853, 1852, when Langstroth is able to finally get his um, bee space defined and patented and and my golly, I mean, you know, Ellie was talking about some of the things that people had tried beforehand. Gene Kritsky writes the most amazing book about all of the failed beehives prior to Langs Lorenzo Langstroth's movable frame hive. And they are beautiful hives. Like one of them is a hexagon shaped, the idea being that if we just build a, you know, a hive that looks like a cell, then the bees are going to just automatically adapt to it. I mean, they are some of the most creative hives that you will ever see, but it's that bee space that makes Lorenzo Langstroth's or Gerson's hive work. And, and that then transforms overnight, you know, you can go from backyard beekeeper to being a commercial beekeeper and make your money from hives uh, because you can actually inspect them then. You can see what they need. You can add a honey super. Um, you know, there's a, you know, it gives, it helps you help the bees. And that's what had been needed. Now the smoker designs <clears throat> follow very quickly and, and if you want an amazingly intriguing, eccentric presentation, Jerry, you should ask Wyatt Mangum to give his presentation on the evolving um, improvements of smokers and railroad engines. Because he says that's where they, they come together, that as, as steam engines improve, so do smokers. And you have to have Wyatt explain it because I certainly can't, <laughs> but he will, he will hold your attention. You will not look at a smoker the same way again, right? So just for future reference, if you choose to, to, to if you choose to, to serve your beekeepers in the role of WAS president and you need speakers, have Wyatt give that talk because it's worth, it's well worth listening to. Um, honey extractors, um, you know, were, uh, were modified at the same time. Um, and then the comb wax foundation really shook things up. Now, I think interestingly enough, in the 20th century and in 21st century, there are people now who are doing top bar hives because they are moving away from comb wax. You know, they don't want uh, the manufactured foundation that's on the market because it has, you know, it has residuals of pesticides, you know. So there's been some interesting movements here, but in a 30 year time period, you know, from 1852, you know, basically to the to 18, 1880s, you've got queen production, you've got these, um, like I said, the honey extractors, all of the other things that can make an industry happen and that are still fueling the industry. industry. We all depend upon these. And um, this is just a review, but I love Tucka Bee's um, photo here of a, of a queen bee alighting on this smoker. And, and Wyatt will say that what really helped the smoker um, progress to a point where we could use it. You know, some of these smokers were just horrible and he has pictures of, of ones that, that don't do well, but you've, you know, you've got your bellows here and you've got that, um, 
that, that chimney pipe here uh, that helps the oxygen, control. it helps the beekeeper control the oxygen. And so, um, and of course I mentioned the comb wax foundation maker, um, which, you know, has become in the 21st century problematic as researchers are beginning to, to learn how many pesticides, um, the residuals of pesticides now are in a lot of our commercially produced beeswax. Um, there's been, I think, real progress in terms of the, the way that we make hives. Uh, I mean, when I started with my grandfather, you had to have 10 frame deeps. They had to be wood. You had to paint them white. Um, the polystyrene hives are really, in my opinion, a step forward, especially for somebody, you know, who doesn't want to be a big time commercial honey producer, um, but you want to be somewhere in between. You want to have more than 10. Uh, you may want to raise your own queens. Uh, this is a good middle step. Um, we like the six frame deeps because, and I'm saying we because I'm including my husband who, who demanded as part of a marital contract that, that we have polystyrene hives as opposed to wooden ones. In other words, he would not stay married to me if I were going to insist on 10 frame deeps. I mean, it would be done. <laughs> you know? So we've made this transition to polystyrene hives and, and uh, you know, we both are much happier. Um, so that's my plug. And, and it's also my encouragement to, to you, uh, to attendees, to consider uh, trying some new equipment um, because we're in our 50s. And, um, you know, Ellie talks about sustainability. We have to, you know, our bodies have to, to be able to sustain what we are uh, doing to them too. So um, the, the image of the bee continued to, to, to bring people together for different uh, ideas, well, even into the, even into the Civil War. Uh, this is a flag that was used. It was donated in 1930s, but it was a regimental flag that was used in the Civil War for uh, one of the companies. Uh, to, to, to pull people together. And then um, I, I'm skipping through here uh, rather quickly because um, I, you know, I realize that it is late, um, but the 20th century to me is remarkable because it creates, the United States creates the first ever industrial agriculture. And so what that means is that we have all of these unique land conditions, Hawaii, for instance, California, Mediterranean. Um, we have Florida. Um, we have Maine, you know, New York. You know, Ellie was talking about New York, all of the Montana, um, Oregon for that matter. I mean, all of these different unique geographical land uh, areas that help us produce specialty crops on a scale that we never ever see before. We have federal aid in the form of USDA. Um, we have state universities that are helping educate um, these different tiers that Ellie had talked about. Unfortunately, but it's the truth, we got to say it, there's an exploitable labor force that can help people take advantage of this unique land. And we have a transportation system that is second to none by the 20th century. So we can, you know, you have this industrial agriculture and, and if you want to read more about that, that is Stephen Stoll, um, another byproduct off of the industrial agriculture is that we also then create what's never been seen before, a chemical shield. And we use a chemical shield to protect all of our specialty crops so that we can grow them on these mass acreages of land. Now, you know, uh, I'm not here to debate the merits or, or um, you know, the, the, the consequences of that. I'm just here to say that that's what defines the, the 20th century. We, as a country, can have access to 90 different types of crops. Uh, that are pollinated, um, but we also have to use chemicals 
to protect some of those crops from thrips, you know, to protect other crops from mealyworms, to protect other crops, you know, they all have pests. And as David said before, you know, it's constant chemical warfare. And our country has created a system which helps fund the, 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 the mentality and the approach of trying to kind of build a balancing act. Um, in, he, you know, David's writing a grant right now that he's gonna turn in on Friday. He's not gonna ask for money for a tie. He's gonna try to frame it, but he's going to win. We're going, to, here's, here's what the beekeepers have used. We use the phrase mite resistant queen. Anyone who's in this game knows that there's no such thing, right? But if David Tarpey wants to get that money, right? <laughs> it's a phrase that we hold on to, right? Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a very powerful idea. It's, a, it's Ellie's magic bees. Um, but, but it's also could be holding us back. You know, that's the point. So here are the characteristics of the industrial countryside. If you're interested, people, this is an academics book. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I mean, if you, you have to commit to wanting to know more about this, but once you do read it, you will not look at the U.S. agriculture the same way again. Um, and of course, you know, Ellie's already mentioned uh, that um, the arrival of varroa mites, which, um, you know, as far as Dr. Seeley's concerned, there was just one post pathogen transfer that happened to his knowledge it didn't happen again. And it happened in Primorsky Cray region over here in Russia, right? Um, but, but we've been dealing with this now, um, you know, ever since. And not just Varroa mites, invasives have also defined the 21st century. Um, those invasives coming in at the end of the 20th, African honeybees. Um, in fact, uh, David Tarpey has, Set up the one lab I know I can send samples to to, to have uh, bees tested for Africanized genetics um, because the USDA bee lab doesn't test them anymore. Small hive beetle arrives in the late 1990s from South Africa. All of these are shaping and shifting um, our uh, how, how it is that we care about bees, but finally science is beginning to lead by the 21st century. Um, it's a tough battle. We are, as G.H. Kale says, the stepchildren of agriculture. Um, you know, these other, um, these other industries, the soybean industry, the corn industry, they have, uh, they have grant writing machines, um, but it's colony collapse disorder that fundamentally changes um, the politics, because all of a sudden now you have Marianne Frazier going to Congress and saying, if one in every three cows died, Congress would be, you know, setting aside funds for research. They would be, uh, you know, helping, you know, cattle farmers get back on their feet. What are you going to do for the bees? And it's that image, right? You know, one in every three beehives are dying. And what are you going to do? And that kind of, that, that helps. Um, so, you know, the offshoots of that, we have Honey Bee Health Survey. Um, 40 states are now participating in this. A, a um, mitigating factor is if a state has a state apiarist that the person can go and take samples from. Um, every state has, you know, Florida has 13 state apiarists. I think North Carolina has five. Is that right, David? Six, Kentucky, uh, if we were doing this interactive poll, I would have you guess how many state apiaries Kentucky has, but we do not. So I'll tell you, it's one. You're looking at her. <laughs> 120 counties, that's my territory. Missouri, no, there's no, there's no state apiaries in Missouri. Um, but, but by far, to me, the, 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 the still the most, the, the, most, um, the most false analogy that we have held on to uh, in, in terms of bees has been this idea of queen bees, right? And how they wanna kill each other. 
And if you just need some good entertainment and you like gospel music, pull up Allie McBeal's season four, episode 21, where these two gospel singers out sing each other, you know, they're both sleeping with the preacher and you know that it's going to get heated. And, and so the, the, the ideas, of course, behind the Queen Bee um, analogy is that women are too competitive with each other. You know, we don't play well with one another. We're going to fight until the other one dies. Um, and, and it's, you know, I think that there's a lot that we don't know about, about Queen Bee still. Um, you know, why is it that some hives have two queens that seem to be coexisting? And how long did they coexist like that? Why is it that when I am catching a swarm, I'm finding three queens in this thing? You know, I'm sure two of them are virgins, but you know, it, there's a lot. I think of, there's a lot of questions. That's that's my point. Um, are we, we're yes. running pretty late here, Ken. Are you about ready to wrap it up? Yep, I will move on to uh, flower power. Our greatest threat right now is that we are losing forage. Every hive needs 252 million flowers, one hive, to get through a full calendar year. And so the USDA has set up conservation reserve programs. The, these particular photos are taken from Flower Power. I'm wanting to show uh, pollen slides so that people see more than just the tree, um, that they also see how unique the pollen is. Um, but that's also led to some money for um, state apiaries to collect native bees in, a, in an effort to kind of get a handle on the Asian giant hornet and make sure that if it does come into the states, we know where it is. Um, I, this has been in the news, so I don't feel like I need to belabor it, but the United States is finally building a native bee inventory um, that I think is long overdue. And, um, you know, I'm part of Project APSM, and we have been helping fund pollinator habitat in addition to the federal programs. Um, I think I'm wrong here. I think that uh, Project APSM and the Bee Butterfly Habitat Fund has planted over 50,000 acres of pollinator habitat since 2013, basically. They had been in existence since 2006, but they really embraced forage uh, beginning in 2013. And so um, just going to plug here, Eastern Apiculture Society. I know that this is Western Apiculture Society, but we are meeting in person should you find yourself in Kentucky. Um, the members will be limited to 300. Um, and I think that 150 have already signed up. So there's still room. Those are my sources, and that's my contact information. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. David, do you want to ask a few questions here? Yeah, no, great, great job, Tammy. And again, uh, everybody use your, the Q&A to type in your questions, and I'll read as many of them as I can get um, to give people a little time to, to do so. Tammy, I just wanted to ask you, well, first I wanted to thank you for um, that example of the first continental dollar that was proposed by Ben Franklin. I, that was new to me. I always learn something every single time, something new every time that I see you to, uh, speak and you know that's gonna wind up in my beginner course. Um, I am definitely yeah. gonna be using that, that wonderful example. Um, so thank you for that. But I, I want to touch on something very quickly, what, what you had said about um, the skep and then the enduring visual imagery of the skep. You know, so to, to tie yours and Ellie's talks together here, you know, uh, 1850, uh, um, is it 53, 59? 52 is, I think, when he has his eureka moment, and it's 53 when the patent. 53 is the patent. Okay, yeah. No. So in the 1850s, we've been keeping bees in, by and large, wooden boxes. Why does Burt's Bees still have a skep on its oh, yeah. logo? Why is the skep so enduring 
as a metaphor for bees and beekeeping? I, th I think it, there's a couple. I mean, I think it's rounded. You know, it, there's something very maternal in its shape. Um, I think it's, the, again, it's, it's the, you know, it's, it's that type of technology that evolved from the land that, you know, in other words, it's, it, you know, people in Germany are, are making these from the grasses, the rye grasses. And England still had workshops teaching people how to make skeps in the, in the 1990s. You know, these were funded classes by British taxpayer money to, to teach people how to make skeps. I mean, I think they had this woman, they must have like cartered her on some horse drawn buggy. I mean, she was a hundred years old, you know? And, you know, she was still, still weaving, still braiding. And, you know, I think it's that too. I think it's an attachment to the land. It's, it, I think people hunger at times for an attachment to the land. We're seeing this in this pandemic too, um, but especially the skep, you know, and like I said, the fact that, you know, in order to waterproof it, you would have to use dung to, to, to coat in those little divots uh, created by the, the straws and the grasses there. And, and it yeah, was a, a, a common method of, it was a common hive structure. Uh, and then the other one before Lorenzo's was the bee gum, you know, which was a tree, right. yep. a lot harder to carry, <laughs> you know, a lot more difficult. Yeah, but, but the gum, right, just like the Langstroth hive or the, you know, any others, they, they don't endure in kind of that, you know, people look at the skep and they know immediately that that's yep. old time beekeeping, old, you know, family farm like granddaddy, right? Like it's just, it, it just encapsulates it so, so really well, you know? Um, and, and, you know, I think you, you brought up the whole thing about going back to the land and why skeps can, can endure today. So do bees, right? I mean, I think a lot of beekeepers, beekeeping is a, is a, you know, an entry point back into agriculture, right? Of getting, <laughs> getting back to, um, you know, the old agrarian, way of life right oh there's no other agricultural industry other than gardening that if somebody would just wake up out of bed and say i'm i'm going to do this you know S some of it is the way that you can do it for instance you look out the window and you see that there's a swarm what better reason than to just go ahead and go buy a hive but i mean no one would just roll out of bed and say well i'm gonna go I'm going to go buy a cow today, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go buy a pig and I'm going to put it in my backyard and let my suburban neighbors, you know, come over and pet it. No, that doesn't happen that way, but people do that with beekeeping. Um, there, there's a saying and, and again, it's an old British saying, like anybody could be a beekeeper, a peon could be a beekeeper at one point in time. This was before varroa mites <laughs> and that host pathogen transfer that we talked about, you know, um, but it's this, it's this thinking that, you know, even the lowliest person with the least education and the least resources could, could at least keep bees, you know, and so I think there's, the, uh, there's that too, um, that gives people a false sense of, of confidence now. For sure. Equal opportunity for, for everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, good point. Excellent points. There's, so a, Anthony, great, there's um, a great phrase. Sorry, um, well, there's a great phrase that was said. Um, there's an agricultural co-op. It was a hippie commune in Tennessee, right? And one of the leaders had this phrase that says that they were all criminally naive when they started this hippie commune, that they were... <laughs> They were going to grow their own vegetables. They were going to, you know, not use any agricultural chemicals. They were going to live off the land. And he said, we could not have been more wrong. Criminally naive. I love it. Um, Anthony uh, has a good point here in saying that he's thinking that the, he's arguing that the 20th century really helped to improve family wealth, better working conditions, fewer, you know, our 
work weeks, you know, those kind of things, increased leisure time that allowed for the advent of more hobbyist beekeepers to get into it. Sure. Right. So, um, so oh, sure. yes. So there was, you know, before it was s such predominant, you know, family farms, everybody work on the farm, everybody had bees, you know, being on the farm, not for pollination, but for the honey and the pollination just was incidental. But as the loss of the family farms, right, um, we had less of that. But that prosperity, as Anthony is saying, then also allowed the prosperization of it being uh, a leisure activity and not just a regular part of farming. Sure. And, you know, it, the second book, Beconomy, uh, kind of tracks how the, the hives had, you know, if there were like 10 hives or less, those were under the domain of the women. You know, uh, there was a phrase in colonial history called dep deputy husband, you know, and that is so that when sailors especially would be gone for months at a time, the, the woman could conduct business in her husband's name. But she also then had charge of the livestock and inclu including the hives. So those were under her control. Um, and when you think about, I mean, beeswax was so important as a form of currency in colonial times. And, you know, since then, uh, women have always been part of beekeeping. Um, you know, that to me um, was what I wanted to show in the second book. I wanted to show all of the different types of hives. Like I have a picture of a friend who was a Peace Corps volunteer, um, you know, in uh, Africa with the, with the log hives. Um, and I wanted to show, you know, the top bar hives that were being introduced to people in Nepal. Um, so I, I really tried to kind of show that women had always had this history. And as the land provided the resources for people to make hives, that women were right there helping take care of the bees that, that were in them. Yeah, I'm going to no, jump in real quick here for Go ahead, uh, Ellie. I posed a question because we the panelists can't ask him for QA. She'd like to know a little bit more, Tammy, about your beekeeping as a stepchild of agriculture on your thoughts. And I want to insert one quick one. I'm never going to wake up, as you know, from my history and say, I want a cow tomorrow in my backyard. But in Missoula, at least chickens are the one thing besides bees that pop up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think post pandemic, post two, I'm sorry, post recession 2008, the two agricultural industries that are most on the rise here in Kentucky are beehives and chickens and uh, followed, followed by hemp, but hemp is, has had a very uh, boom or bust uh, roller coaster ride. But the G.H. Kale quote, Ellie, G.H. Uh, Kale was the editor of American Bee Journal, I think approximately from the 1940s through the 60s or 70s. And so he saw firsthand how, how um, you know, be, the beekeeping industry uh, began to be outmuscled by other agricultural industries in the race for USDA funding. And so that's his quote, and I use it all the time, you know, because at that point in time, even as pollination, as, as a, as a, viable form of, of, you know, contract and cash flow for beekeepers is beginning to get codified. In other words, the almond industry is really beginning to up its game, right? Post-World War II, right? Um, it's also, the beekeeping industry is also being, like I said, out-muscled, out-flanked, you know, out-pesticided, out, you know, outnumbered, everything is beginning to work against the commercial industry by the 1950s and G.H. Kale knew it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I, I, like I said, I've, I've sort of heard it before and I'm, but it's the idea also that the fortunes are intertwined in, in more positive ways too, that you know, more almonds does mean more bees, but, but you're at the mercy of, of, uh, of much bigger economic interests, I guess. Well, and what I find so interesting about reading Stephen Stoll is he has this great handle on the industrial agricultural countryside. 
you know, he's got it divided into five neat characteristics. He doesn't include pollination. Like you can only have an industrial countryside if you have bees, you know? And that to me was where the first book ends. It ends with the fact, I mean, Stephen Stoll proved G.H. Kale's point. Beekeepers are stepchildren, right? <laughs> and the way, I think also it's been observed before, but like in entomology departments, I think mostly everybody's trying to kill all the other ones is sort of how it works. <laughs> but mo but the bees were kind of, were in, I mean, that's not maybe, but maybe um, silkworms are also into another. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say in my entomology department, I'm the only <laughs> one who doesn't want to kill something. So, yeah. Oh, I, well, there my, you are. My, my my long term mentor is long past now. His comment was that the, he was more into basic research, and um, but his comment was that there's a lot of squirt gun entomologists around. Oh, who was your mentor, Jerry? Jimmy Pepper. Oh, I don't know what that name. He was the department chair for 39 years and so on. He had a colleague up in uh, Canada whose name was Salt, and they they really tried to figure out a study they could put together just so they could publish under Salt and Pepper. Oh, that's great. Well, all right. Uh, th thanks, uh, everybody, for all the questions, and I'll hand it back over to you, Jerry. Okay, thank you. Well, I think it's been a great evening. Uh, uh, I, wise choice, I think, to to focus on people and beekeepers and the sociological things. And it, it, and I agree with David. I think this is an area that really needs to be looked at more. Uh, we, and some of the things we see playing out, not only in beekeeping, but even on our own politics these days and so on, that shows us just how naive we have been about some of these things. So um, I, I thank everybody. And they, this has all been recorded. So it will be posted on the WAS um, uh, pages. So if we give everybody a hand. And thank you. And next month, we're going to have two really good speakers from New Zealand on marketing honey in creative ways and the gold rush of Manuka. So the two different perspectives. The first one's from a, a woman who is an inspired marketing expert, and she also is involved with Colos and Apomondia. So um, so the, we'll talk about honey and honey marketing from some folks in New Zealand that essentially have some very interesting perspectives and tammy and ellie and david thank everybody for a really enjoyable evening uh, i appreciate all your time and effort and i know how late you're staying up so <laughs> good night everyone good night everyone thanks for attending thank you